Yeah, thank you very much for the for the introduction. I think I think the whole the whole of the presentation will will give you an indication of, of what we can do. Uh, but basically, um, I think um, what we what we are we're basically we're a, um, a land subsidence company, and we're only using satellite Insar. Really, that's that's all we do. Really, we've got our own USB. Um, in that we're doing a big data analysis of satellite radar data and um, our products um, enable all of our clients in lots and lots of different markets um, to benchmark areas for development, to ascertain risk of various assets and, and landscape features, um, to look at existing assets uh, and also uh, to monitor their own activities regarding energy futures and and also climate change, which is quite a a different sort of pack um, that I think we're we're using in SAR for. Okay, well that's the that's that's the, the the company bumper. The basically the reason why why I'm here is that um, there was a number of head, headlines related to a, a Nature paper. That we were involved with, um, and you can see see an example of the of there on the right hand side from mining.com. We can see we'd done a study of the uh, dam collapse at Brumadino that happened a couple of years ago. Um, the, um, the the Vale Dam in um, in Minas Gerais in Brazil, that was a, an embankment dam. Um, it collapsed. Causing loss of life and also um, sort of quite dire economic consequences as well. Um, there have been many attempts to um, look at the dam and try and see if there are any precursors uh, to the collapse. And the Nature paper that we generated actually showed some um, some precursors. Now we did this work with the with the University of Nottingham. Uh, we did the, the survey using our um, our INSAR approach, which, as I say, is, is rather unique, and I'll explain that later. But they did the prediction based on an inverse velocity analysis, and I believe there's a there's a, a second presentation, hopefully, uh, that you're you're in the process of organising, which will um, which, for which you'll bring in my colleague Steve Grebby from the University of Nottingham to explain a little bit more about that. Now, Steve's a bit more of a, a geologist um, and a geotechnical guy. Um, give you much more insight into into that. Whereas I'm really, in terms of this presentation, I'm just going to talk about the the innovation, the the way that we're measuring subsidence and why it's different from from what other people can do. So, um, and just to to sort of illustrate that, my my background, my background is actually mathematics. Um, I'm not a geological or a geotechnical engineer. I did a PhD in satellite orbital dynamics. I completed that in 1987. And since then, I've worked in uh, satellite radar earth observation. Um, probably um, for, I think, for 15 years of that time, I was at a university, but the rest of the time, I'm, I've been in, in the commercial remote sensing industry. So I'm, I straddle straddle the both both of them if you like um, my main expertise is in radar image geometry um, basically i do author rectification which is essentially map making uh, and commercially i have uh, done stereo work SAR stereo work and also obviously more recently in SAR work and i've done it through a lot of applications in support of a lot of applications everything from agriculture to topographic mapping You'll see from the, the right hand side of this slide, I've also worked at many different places. Um, basically, I started off in 1987 working for GC Marconi Research Centre, which were a radar establishment uh, here in the UK. And since then, I've taken my expertise in, in radar geometry and applied it in many applications at many different places, including the European Space Agency, the European Union. Uh, a number of commercial companies there in, in the UK and the Netherlands. Uh, and during my stint at Nottingham, I was also seconded to the University of Nottingham at, at, in China, the Ningbo campus. So I've been around a bit, um, done lots of things, worked in lots of different ways, but all in satellite radar. That's my, that's my expertise. 
Okay, so um, it's going to be a bit of a lecture for a while, I'm afraid. I apologise for that. But um, for those of you that are probably are aware of radar, you can take a bit of a back seat. But I thought I'd go through some basics just to tell you what we're doing. Um, so radar, uh, synthetic aperture radar, which is a particular type of radar uh, that we use is, as you would expect, it, um, it sends out a pulse of energy and listens for an echo. Um, it produces its own illumination, which means it's an active sensor. And that also means that it can work day or night and can see through cloud. And the, these are the sorts of things why, why a lot of remote sensing people go for radar, that you, no matter what the cloud cover's like, whether it's day or night, you're guaranteed an acquisition. And back in 1987, that was a big, big bonus um, for the data as opposed to like optical images. Where you've got a lot of cloud cover and you need you need uh, sunlight in order to to make acquisitions and this is how how a radar works in terms of making images of the ground it's different from something like a lidar a lidar sends out many sort of small pencil thin pulses um, and gets lots and lots of echoes but a radar um, actually sends out a very broad beam. It sends out a single pulse and it illuminates quite a large area. I mean, when I say large area, it's generally from satellites, you're talking about tens of kilometers in width. So it illuminates quite a large area. But you send a pulse, it hits the area, and then you listen for an echo. And the echo that you get back is something like you see on the, the right hand side of the screen there, where basically you suddenly get uh, an increase in power when the echo comes back. Now, uh, the, on the left-hand side, I've got two points on the ground, A and B. A is closer to the antenna and B is further away. So you get an echo back from A before you get an echo from B. So things are ordered in terms of their range, which is the distance from the radar. And your timing, um, the pulse sends in um, at the speed, sends a pulse at the speed of light. So if you time the echo, you can tell basically the range, the distance to targets within that entire echo. And when you stick one of these radars on a satellite that's sort of generally sweeping round the round the Earth and pointed at the ground, and make regular pulses, make regular echoes, you can line them up. And by lining them up, hey, hey, you can get yourself an image. Yeah, and that's essentially how a radar image is formed. It's just these individual pulses as the radar is sweeping along in orbit, and you can form an image. So that's that's basically the, the really the basics of, of radar remote sensing there in about three slides. And at the moment, there's lots of satellites currently up there. This is a selection of the most common ones, but there's there's a few more up there, a few more planned. Uh, some of them are civilian, some of them are not, um, but most, uh, some of them are institutional and data is free. Others are premium and you have to pay for it, uh, but there's a hell of a lot to choose from. So radar satellites are there and you can collect data over any single point in the world, whenever whenever you like, it's it's all there. Now we're using something called INSAR, and INSAR is a little bit different. It uses the phase to measure dif distance. So um, on the on the right there, you see that we um, we've got a schematic where we're sending a pulse from a radar down to a target. Um, and the radar goes in waves, and you can you assign wave sort of um, a representation of the, of the pulse. The sine wave have, has a wavelength, which is typically around about 5.6 centimeters for the common C-band satellites. Um, and basically, um, if you measure the phase back at the radar antenna, you can relate the phase in radians. It's an angle um to basically the distance now that allows you to actually make a range measurement if you can at um to an order of centimeters or less it can be very accurate it's very similar to sort of rtk if any of you are used to uh, gnss data um it can be a very 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 accurate accurate thing however 
from a single point it, pulse it's a little bit difficult because you get a lot of errors there's errors due to atmospheric delay radars are transmit receive in this schematic the radar pulse goes from the antenna to the target and comes back again um, so there's a scattering component depending on the makeup of the target that could change the phase um, but there's also um, a noise component as well so you can't really measure range this way from a single image however if you've got more than one image you can you can do something quite clever and that quite clever thing is based on things um, something that's called a, a moiré pattern um, and these are the sorts of things that uh, are very common if you're if you're driving down the motorway like in the bottom right there you often see uh, if you've got two two fence posts two lots of fence posts on, a, on an overhead gantry or something you can see sort of large scale patterns which which are actually representative of the superposition of the two poles um, and these mare patterns uh, which you see and i've got another example there on a chain link fence on the left hand side we've almost got like exponential curves um, and also on the top there there's an, an animation that shows sort of two concentric rings uh, two images of concentric rings going over one another and you can see the radial moire patterns uh, these are very useful to identify subtle changes um, in differences between the between the two representations and if i show on the next slide what i what i mean if we actually have a, a SAR image, which is on the left there, uh, the range is is changing, or the the, the the range is changing across the image from near to far, from that A to B on the on the previous thing. So the the range is increasing from left to right on the image on the left, and the image in the middle, the range is interrupted a little bit because there's been some land motion because the range has changed because the the land has gone up or down or nearer or further away to the satellite just very slightly only needs to be of the order of centimeters or millimeters and if we do this into interferometry which is if we generate these moire patterns between those two images we get what we we have on the right hand side there we get what we term as an interferogram which is basically uh, it basically becomes a map of the change in land position between the two acquisitions. So here we've got an image before, an image after, which may be something like an earthquake or a change or something, and then we get um, we get these moire patterns which show the deformation. And here's a real one. So this is one from a, a SAR image. Um, so this is um, this is uh, an earthquake that occurred on the 26th of December 2003 in in Bam, uh, which is southern Iran, um, and basically what we have there, we have two SAR images from a satellite called Envisat. That were, one was acquired before the earthquake, and one was acquired after the earthquake. And then we form this interferogram. I we courage the two images, just like I showed you with the Moire uh, Moire patterns, and you get this pattern, which we've nicely coloured so that we can see the fringes, i.e. These, these contours of change quite easily. And this actually becomes an image of the deformation. It's the contours of the deformation. And actually, when you do the maths, you find that each, each color change in this instance represents 2.8 centimeters of deformation. So then, you can do an interpretation of that. You can then take the contours, make a, make a map of the deformation and find that basically in this instance, um, we, have a, we have a geological fault that's coming to action. There is some deformation on the fault. In the upper concentric rings, uh, that's corresponding to a subsidence event. And in the lower, it's, it's an uplift. So the, the land has actually tilted, whereas the 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 western part of the of the image is relatively stable nothing happened but to the east of the fault you got this tilt and th this was a remarkable result because it unearthed a, a hidden fault you, you can see on the diagram there they, they had, there was already a hidden fault through bam um, and that didn't come into play here it unearthed a new fault 
So using this this sort of moiré patterns, this interferometry, we, you can measure sort of like sudden change. Now this isn't new. Um, this is the cover of Nature from I think 1993. So it's already you know a technique that's uh, 30 years old. Um, so, um, but it has transformed the study of earthquakes in particular, this particular type of thing. But it must be said, you know, like moiré patterns, like um, uh, interferometry is relative, it's not absolute. You're seeing the change, but it's not an absolute sort of method of identifying the change. The motion is in one dimension only. We're measuring the, the phase, difference in phase. And phase, you remember, is representative of the range, uh, which is the distance from the center. So you can only see things moving towards or away from the sensor. Um, those errors that I mentioned, things like atmospheric delay, can cause problems with getting very, very accurate. Uh, Andrew? Measures. Yes? Andrew, uh, can we just ask people to switch the microphones off, please? Getting some feedback. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, I, I could hear that as well. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, okay. Andrew, you're muted. Could you unmute yourself too, please? Oh, that must have come uh, come on automatically. <laughs> Sorry I did that. that. Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I was just saying that the, there are some limitations to this, things like the, uh, the relative deformation, the motion is one dimension. Uh, we can't, it's very difficult to get sub-centimeter precision because of atmospheric delay. Um, and if the motion is too large, particularly if it's large between pixels, you know, you get, you get very tightly cloaked, uh, tightly um, together fringes. Uh, then it's very difficult to see anything. So it's only good for really very small and very slow moving or slowly varying deformation across the landscape, but it's still quite transformational. Where am I? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we're moving on. We're, we're going to try and see if we can get more accuracy. Because that sort of that sort of thing that we had before with the concentric rings, as I say, it's great for earthquakes. But if we have slow observations, you know, observations that change less than a centimeter between uh, uh, between observation between acquisitions, we can't see it because atmosphere and things like that overwhelm the signal. Now, when we look at the signal, um, the bit that we want, the geometry, can actually be filtered out from and the atmospheric and other noise sources or uh, anomalous sources can be removed if we make a lot of observations because either they're random over time so the gaussian mean zero or they're correlated to a very well-known parameter uh, for example in this one the phi dem that that error source is actually due to a, a, a topographic height error so if we have a lot of observations, we can average these out or remove by regression. Now, um, so if we do this, um, we need to make sure that we're using consistently high quality observations. Um, we don't want to be in places where the noise is too high or they change between um, observations has been too much because as you saw from the Mare patterns, if the change is too much, you'll just get rubbish. Um, so what happens is these tend to occur for bright constant targets, such as buildings, infrastructure, and, and bare rock. Um, natural surfaces like vegetation um, are seen uh, to be too variable over time. So they're not persistent enough. So we're actually looking for, for what's known as persistent scatterers that, that give good quality in all in a big load of observations. Um, this is a, the image that you can see on the right there is, a, is basically a measure of the, the quality of the phase in the, um, well, it's basically the East Midlands and South Yorkshire. There. You can see I've highlighted Leeds, Sheffield and Nottingham. And if you know the area, you can see the Humber up in the top, top right. Um, it just so happens there that the bright areas, i.e. the areas of good quality, are the urban areas. 
and that's what we'd expect because urban areas they're, they're not moving they're not going anywhere um the buildings and things are always going to be there for you know for decades or whatever it is so so you're always going to get good quality measurements but go out into the fields into the agriculture into the bare land and things aren't so so good so if we then do this analysis using this persistent scatterer principle to measure sort of the rates of change of motion over areas like this and this is what we get so you'll see a few of these images during the presentation so in this one you can see this is a map of the the average deformation or the average rate of motion uh, over a two-year period from 2017 to 2019 and I've color coded it so that blue represents uplift or motion towards the sensor and red is motion away from the sensor. Now in this case, we've got a lot of motion due to the uh, due to um, uh, legacy coal mining. So this used to be a, this was one of the uh, largest coal mining areas in the UK, the, the Nottinghamshire and South Yorkshire coal field. Um, but a lot of the mines there have closed down have been closed for, for 30 years in, in a lot of cases. So what we see here is the effect of rising groundwater since the pumps, they've generally been very deep. So uh, they were pumped of water for about a century and then the pumps are switched off and the, the water has, been to has gone to recover. So for some areas in the, the blues, you can see uplift due to groundwater rebound. But you can also see for the deeper mines, um, the inundation of water has actually caused the collapse of some of the pillars. And you can see these collapses occurring. Now, if you look at the scale on there, you can see we, we've got a scale of plus or minus one centimetres. So minus one centimetre is subsidence and plus one centimetre is uplift. And you can see that uh, basically this is a very, very accurate, quite a precise sort of measurement compared to the sort of rough measurements that we were making when we were looking at earthquakes. So that's brilliant. So job solved. However, it's not that well solved because we get very poor coverage over the rural areas because we don't find persistent scatterers in those areas. Now, there's lots of different methods that can be applied. Um, some of them are research and some are commercial. Um, I just thought I'd refer to this. There's been a number of studies like this, but I'll refer to this, this one by Osman Oglu um, in the literature where he compared four different types of methods. They're, they're all very similar. And you can see by the, um, by the figure that I've taken from the paper there that the, the coverage is, is, is just about the same. And actually the results are just about the same as well. They all sort of agree on the, the magnitude of, of the motion that we see. So that's, that's good. But you see, we, in this one, he's compared th four different methods, PSI, SBAS, STAMPS, and SQUESAR. Uh, and he's found some differences. Uh, he's found that PSI is good if there's an urban target. SBAS and STAMPS get more points in rural areas and Squeezar is, is very good at time series. However, he does, does conclude that the methods are, were unable to make measurements over the agricultural or the naturally vegetated areas, which, as I say, is a, is a restriction of these methods. Now, probably about time I showed you a tailings dam, um, just to basically tell you what's, what's, um, what can be done using current methods. So this was a, a famous uh, failure of the Cadia mine uh, in Australia, in New South Wales, on uh, the 9th of March, 2018. So what we've got here is an analysis of data from 2015 to 2018. And like before, uh, we're showing you the average motion there. Um, and the scale on this, you'll see from the figure, is plus or minus 15 millimeters per year. And you can see along the failure site, uh, we see a red, so we see a, see a slump. It's not the only red we see in the figure. We do see reds associated with the rock dump, which might be due to settlement. We also see some blues um, around the edge of, the, of one of the pits. Um, that, that could have a number of different connotations. It might have something to do with the imaging geometry. But here we're looking at the, 
we're looking at the northern tailing storage facility there. Um, we can see some collapse and we can also draw the time series of motion of points on that collapsing area and you can see uh, from the graph that I've chosen one there and it shows a significant dip, a significant sort of collapse, uh, sort of subsidence before the actual failure. So this is this is a really good result and this is the the sort of reason why I think uh, INSAR is, is showing some excellent promise uh, for the monitoring of, of tailing stamps. But it's it's not all good news. Uh, I'll say the limitations for this this thing of having persistent scatterers is a, is a bit of a problem. Uh, and you can see here I've got an area of uh, of Brazil here, where we've got two tailing stamps in that uh, figure there. Um, there's I don't know what the large thing in the middle. It might be um, just a, a spoil heap uh, or dry tailings. I don't know. But the the extremities of the left and right are, are clearly um, tailings dams and you can see one of them has no points on it and the other one has some um, so it's not it's not a universal sort of technique um, so this this poor coverage it makes it a bit of a problem to be used everywhere because um, it means that you might miss deformation or not describe them very well so now you could try and mitigate this by using data from different satellites or, uh, as some some people do, they place artificial corner reflectors in the field to try and to try and um, to try and densify the network. So this is um, where um, this is just an example of where people have compared high resolution sensors to low resolution sensors to try and densify a network. And I think I have a problem with this because yes as you can see you might get more points but you're not really improving the capability of the of the technique to make measurements in a rural area or an area that doesn't have persistent scatterers and hopefully you'd agree with those two things we've got a low resolution or relatively like medium resolution 10 to the 1 satellite at 14 meter resolution uh, when if you jump to a 3 meter higher resolution 3 meter cosmo sky med data you're basically getting the same result. Um, it's very, very difficult to to say that that you're getting an improvement there by using high resolution. Um, I mean, and I've also said in the text there that if you look at the UK, I think seven percent of the UK is classified as urban and infrastructure. Now, whatever sensor you're using and whatever high resolution you've got, you can you're only going to cover seven percent of the UK. So you know it's it does seem to me a little bit of a a misnomer that you, if you go for high resolution you get a better result sure if it's if the area is covered with distant scatterers you'll be able to describe it much better but if it isn't you're not going to improve things by going high resolution um, another thing that um, people do is they put corner reflectors in the field um, what you see on the right is a, is a campaign that I did when I was at the University of Nottingham with, with my PhD student John Layton, you can see there in the picture. We went around the, uh, the uh, landscape and, and did um, co-located measurements of, of GPS and uh, corner reflectors just to, to check this was for looking at atmospheric delay. And corner reflectors, they're very cheap, they're passive, they're just three three basically plates bolted together. It's very easy to do that, but basically I think in, in the examples that I've shown, you would need a lot of them um, in order to really identify sort of good subsidence characteristics on a, a, across the whole scale of the scale of the asset. Um, I've, I've seen things where people have asked to put installation, install these on steep slopes above, above um, dams where there's problems with, with earthquakes. Installation could be dangerous. They do require maintenance. If you put these in a snowy area, um, they, they, they often need to be scraped out of the snow. Um, you can't make retrospective measurements. You, you can only start making SAR measurements in the field when you put a corner reflector out there. So if you've got 10 years archive data, you still can't use it. Um, and in our experience, also looking at, at peatland surfaces and soils, 
uh, even something relatively light like a corner reflector could sink into a soil uh, and therefore not give you the measurement that you want. So, um, so they have to be used with care. They're not a they're not a perfect solution for any of this. So, um, I mean, this is really what uh, I think. If you look in the big book of of, of Insar, this this is really the capability that you see. But since this the development of these time series methods in around about 1999, um, there's these, uh, there's been a huge boom in, in services based on INSAR in, in a lot of different fields. And it's a very competitive landscape. Uh, there's a, a more, well more than a dozen companies um, registered across the world, all vying for business in, in for um, engineering um, applications and things like that. However, um, in my opinion, uh, this success has breeded some complacency. Um, everybody's just accepted that inside doesn't work over natural and vegetated terrain. Um, and if you say it does, then it's blasphemy. I think, um, you know, um, myself and, and some of my research students have been quite roundly criticised at, at meetings for, for saying that's it's not true. But if you look at the evidence, sorry, if you, so if you look in the textbooks, then this is what you see. Now we're, we're most commonly using C-band satellites, which is the center thing. And, and according to the textbooks, C-band data cannot see through vegetation, um, it can't see through dry soils, and it can't see through dry snow. Now, at the moment, I'm just going to concentrate on vegetation. Um, and so this is basically what you get thrown at you when 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 you say, well, I think it does um the tea through vegetation you get the textbooks thrown at you and these are the same textbooks i was reading when i was learning about SARS. so i completely understand this um however the evidence just doesn't back it up um i think the the big one is that about 15 years ago uh, some scientists were looking at at, um, at the peat swamp forests in louisiana and florida uh, and particularly looking at the um at the, the water levels, trying to measure the water levels um, through a, a moderate uh, vegetation canopy. And they found that they could get fringes, they could get very strong fringes. And you can see an example there on the right, on the extreme right of this, uh, of this slide here. They could actually see measurements using C-band, which as I say, the, the textbooks say doesn't work. Um, uh, using C-band to, to measure that, and it goes completely against current preconception so it, it allowed them to to basically work up a theory and, and they're now using c-band to measure changing water levels in, in these areas now we've we've done the same we we've not looked at at, um, at sort of water levels but we've also noticed that if we look at our interferograms over various natural terrain it's not true that radar does not work over those areas and i've got some examples there of over the Black Forest in Germany and also the um, North Selangor Peak Swamp Forest in Malaysia, um, and you do see um, you do see these interfer interferometric patterns, which suggests that we are able to see through the vegetation. Now you can't see them everywhere; it certainly doesn't persist, and different parts of the forest may vary, may may become sort of good quality um, now but not tomorrow and things like that but there it's it's basically there's information in there and and we've tried tried basically hard to to work on that and try and pull that out so we can do interferometry over vegetated surfaces now back in 2012 i think i i had a, an idea to try and do this and i was looking at the at the uh, coal uh, 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 the coal mining, the old coal mining areas in uh, South Derbyshire and North Leicestershire in the UK. And I was doing conventional insight. At that time, I was working with the British Geological Survey. I'm trying to work up a, a research proposal. And they asked me, they said to me, surely you can get this to work over vegetation, can't you? Because it's you're only seeing part of the deformation. And this is what happened. So you can see the conventional result in the in the top top left of the figures there and that that's only over the urban areas 
So then I found some way of taking these signals of opportunity from uh, from the vegetated terrain and work them up and, and densify the network. And British Geological Survey, they took that, they took my result and they correlated it to the geology and they found very, very good um, correlation to the coal motions. So we got quite a remarkable result there. And that, so that was really, really very good. So then I sort of, if you like, approached the INSAR community and said, look, look, we've got this really good result. And it was, I approached them with, with British Geological Survey. And they just said, no, you can't do it. It's impossible, which was uh, quite a, an arrogant thing to say. I mean, OK, I might not have got it right, but, but basically they, they basically slammed the door on it. Uh, which basically meant that, that I was unable to get scientific funding because they were the scientists that would be signing off the grants and the papers. Very, very, very difficult then once you've got an idea and a good result to then move forward. So from that point, we realised that, that academia was not going to um, support this. So basically, we patented it and started a company and with a lot of grants and a lot of innovation help um, we we then built it up since then so since well since the invention in 2012 and since the establishment of the company in 2015 we've actually worked with a lot of universities and industry across the world doing case studies and we tested tested the method to see if it would work over different uh, different terrains um, so we're now at the point where we've got um, at least 20 uh, high-ranking peer-reviewed publications that shows that the method works. Uh, we run the Copernicus Master's Prize in 2014 because I think at that point, although we hadn't done a lot of the validation by then, I think there was enough people to say, ooh, this is, this is an interesting innovation. Uh, in 2019, we were named as one of the 15 star companies of the UK space sector. In, and, um, and then this year, we've just received now significant seed funding from a number of investors. So we're now starting to actually apply, uh, offer the technique as a commercial service. So it's been a bit of a slog to prove it. Um, and as I say, you get a lot of opposition, but, um, but now we're doing all right. We're in a good place. So, so what's now possible is that basically we we've done enough testing now um, in high latitudes and, and tropics. Um, we can get about ninety eight percent coverage over all terrain types. We don't need corner reflectors. Uh, we can do local, regional, and national maps. Um, we can, can take full advantage of all the free archives of data that exist. And it's currently patent pending. Nobody else can do it. So we're the only people that are doing this. And nobody else has got a license to do it either. And I'm the inventor, believe it or not. So that's quite interesting. So the, the sort of results we're getting. So here's an example here. Even over an urban area, and this is looking at an area of Beijing, um where you can see with the dashed lines i've overlaid the the geological faults on there you can see that the comparison of our results which we're using a method which we've called apsis um our apsis results on the on the right are basically a, a transformational from the what the conventional insar can get on the left there and so on the left you're getting all the reflections from the buildings and the roads which is great if you're monitoring buildings and roads. Um, but if you want a, a synoptic view of the deformation against things like geology and all that sort of thing, it seems like our, our product or what we can do is, is far superior. We can see the complete characteristics of the deformation and we can do that anywhere. Uh, an example of a, of a rural area here is a, is a landfill area. Um, this is up in Scotland. Uh, you can see there's a landfill area there that was, it was actually formerly a, an open cast coal mine. Um, it was then used as landfill and they are looking to, to, build a, a, to build a housing estate on the site. So we were actually asked to do a survey of this site 
um, just to see what the deformation characteristics were like. And um, and you can see that we um, using a conventional INSAR because you're not in you're in a completely rural environment. You hardly get any points. Whereas using our method, we get lots of points. We can see the deformation in red, and you can also see that a lot of the deformation is correlated to the uh, to the depth contours that we've we've actually superimposed there. So so it works. Okay, back to back to mining. Um, so, so now you can see that we've now sort of started to apply it to the to the mining scenario. Um, as I say, I'm not going to go through the the Brumadino mine thing. I'm going to leave that to Steve. But you can see this is an example of the the difference in coverage that we can get compared to using an Apsis method compared to it. From, Conventional SAR, yes, you can still get a lot of points with conventional in SAR, but, but we get a complete coverage. And you can see in this case, the Boddington Gold Mine in Australia, uh, we do see deformation of the of the tailing dam there in red. And you can see the detail. And for all of the points there, we can generate a, a time series of motion to show in this case that this is this is probably just a settlement or compression. So there's no there's no indication there of any acceleration over time. So I, I wouldn't say there's any any risk at this this one, but I'm not the expert. <laughs> Leave that to Steve. The thing is, we can also generate. And I hope you can see this. We can also generate animations of the motion. It's it's great to do those graphs um, that you saw on the previous slide, which are really wonderful, but you don't get a, a view of the, the sort of like the spatial motion and the way that points grow and their relationship to each other sort of spatially. Uh, in this way, um, this is a, an animation of the Boddington Dam. Um, you can see, you can see basically how the, um, how the deformation moves over time. We've got the dates over there on the left hand side. Um, and you can see it basically evolving. So this is cumulative displacement over time, if you like. So you can see the reds intensifying as we go ahead. And you can see the scale there is, is plus or minus three centimeters. So, um, so that's it's quite a quite a night. Nice, a lot of our clients have found this quite a nice way of summarizing the results. So I'll, I'll basically I'll possibly let that run a little bit more, just so you can see the the point starting and, and the most intense part of the deformation and, and how it's spreading out. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm not the expert, so I don't know what the how significant is, but it, it makes a nice thing to, to actually show people. So I shall move on to the next slide. We, we can also, if we've got satellite observations monitoring from the left and right, we can actually do a stereo analysis and, and pull out uh, east, west, and, and up down motion. We can resolve the two, two directions. In this case, we've got a dam in Uzbekistan, and basically it's, it's moving as the, as the reservoir is filling up and emptying over the seasons. So you can see in both the east, west, and the up down signatures of motion on that dam that you get a sinusoid, which is very well caught correlated to the to the height of the height of the reservoir but you can also see that the dam is surrounded by other features there's there's a land quite a large landslide going on a slow landslide and also an area of subsidence quite close to the dam in this case they're not really threatening the dam but there are circumstances where they may be it may be that they're that you need to know a bit more about those because they're in in close vicinity to the dam or close to the reservoir So here's another um, here's another tailings dam in Chile um, where we've done this stereo sort of view. So this again, this is an average motion map um, showing the up down characteristics of the of the uh, area, but also in this case we've got an east west motion. Now there are holes in the coverage you can see, and that's because as shown on an earlier side, the radar is actually an oblique sensor. So you actually get areas that you can't see that are occluded because of the perspective. Uh, and they're just holes that, that you just can't see because of the perspective. Nobody can see in those areas. Um, but for that area, we can also, we can also generate um, time series. 
so you can see the evolution of the motion as you can see the you see steady collapse in the in the up down motion the east west is quite interesting because what we're seeing there the reds the reds are are a motion is motion towards the west and the blue is towards the east and, and you can see the blues tend to start on the on the uh, left hand side and the reds on the right and you, you, so you've got something like a pincer movement going on so I, I don't know what that means in terms of the motion of the dam but i just find that I find that very interesting so whereas the up and down is just basically just slow motion as we go through the years uh, the east west is is much more uh, much more interesting in this case um, but as i say I, I haven't done an interpretation of it so i don't i don't particularly know what it means but it's uh, but then again it is quite interesting but i'll i'll move on so um as i say we can do very large areas here's a, here's a map we did of germany for a, a demonstration um in germany um well, there's a lot of mining going on a lot of it to do with uh, lignite so for example there's a <coughs> the very fam famous lignite mines in north rhine westphalia in the western part of germany um gartz gartzweiler is that what they're called gartzweiler 2 so you get a lot of reds there a lot of subsidence which is due to the um basically due to the water a pumping of water out from the from the lignite mines uh, lignite's a very wet substance um, and you can see it's spreading several kilometers uh, under roads and under, under villages but you also see the same happening on the on, on the eastern border because there's a large lignite mining area in lusatia in uh, on the border with poland there you can also see some blues if you look closely on that slide and that's that's potentially due to uh, recovery uh, when they've stopped mining the water tends to uh, go back and, and you see a, a commensurate heave uh, due to due to recovery so that, that's on a nice one um, this was a, an area when we were looking at Brumadino we also looked at this this mine Gongo Soko it was um, one that was threatening collapse at the same time as Brumadino here the collapse was a little bit more interesting because you had the had main mine pit um, going on um, there where you could see areas of collapsing collapse and rebound and the worry was that the collapsing wall particularly the one on the the left there the blue area um, was going to cause essentially a, a tsunami um, in the abandoned mine which would overtop and go down the hill into the into the Sol Superior uh, tailing storage facility uh, and um, then basically break that that dam. Um, it didn't happen. Uh, I think I don't know whether Steve will go into this, but we applied the same analysis and saw that there wasn't any threat of that. But it's quite a complicated area. This, as you see, you can see collapse of walls. You can see areas of rebound. Um, and you can also see uh, compression of the spore heat, but also compression on the on the top of the tailings as well. So that's quite interesting. So we can see underground resources there. Um, so um, you can see here, this is an area of oil recovery through injection of CO2. Um, so you can see basically the whole characteristics of the, of the motion. Um, another example here is groundwater recovery uh, in the in the East Midlands, uh, where you can see groundwater coming up, um, rising as mines are switched off, and they tend to be bound by these ponds and things like that that are underground. So in this case, you can use these models from our data to actually predict the collapse. Um, and here's some. Um, I think the a lot a lot of previous INSAR studies have stayed away from very high latitude and vegetated areas um, we don't have to uh, we can monitor mines in in alaska uh, there you can see the athabasca all sand all sands there uh, and you can see a, a basically a, a an injection site there at fire bag that is uplifting due to the injection of um, of water to actually pump out the uh, pump out the oil underneath 
Okay, so final slide. I could show you examples all, all day, but I won't. Um, so NSAR has really proven itself to be a, a standard tool for the remote monitoring of subsidence. So there's a large commercial market and it's an enormous research subject. There's a load of satellites up there that support that capacity, some of which providing free data, which is fantastic. And for one of the satellites, Sentinel-1, there's at least a five-year archive of data for every point on the Earth's surface. So if, if any of you know a mine, you could immediately do a baseline survey um, over that area. I mean, however, to, this is a huge resource and a huge capability. We need to continually question our assumptions as to what the capability of these techniques are. Um, and here we've we've actually shown that it, it's possible to challenge those prevailing notions about what the technology can do and bring benefits to the monitoring of mines and assets across the world. So I think I'll I'll end that there. So thank you very much everyone.